Thank you, Cheryl, and welcome everyone. We welcome all of you who are here in attendance at, uh, in our sanctuary this morning. We welcome those of you who are watching online via the internet at home. We, we're glad to have all of you with us this morning, so welcome. Hey, we just uh, want to uh, let you know today we have a little surprise, someone who's back. He's been actually very taxed lately, and that is our music director, Michael Davis, is back with us. He's been helping the family business in Arkansas, doing taxes for the, since, uh, what, right after Christmas time. And so we welcome him back and uh, just so glad to uh, see his smiling face, even if it's partially behind a mask today. So with that, those are all the announcements I have this morning. We'll have a time for prayer here in, in a few minutes, but we welcome you. And uh, we pray that this time of worship will, um, will give us an opportunity to... Uh, to listen to God and see what God has to say to each one of us this day. So let us come and worship God together. Good morning. Please stand if you are able and join me in the call to worship. We've come to worship God who makes streams flow from rock, who turns the parched earth into springs of water, who sends the rain from heaven and makes the wilderness blossom and flourish. As the deer joins the, for the flowing streams, so we thirst for you, O God. Come, let's worship our life-giving God who pours out living water on all who thirst. Please join me in the prayer of confession. God of living water, you call us to come and drink. So why do we sit here and complain that there is not enough water? You call us to strike the rocks of our world and let your living water flow. But we do not trust enough that the spring is there. We want to find the water on our own, using our own wisdom. You call us to share the water of life with the world around us, but we believe that the water is limited, not abundant, and so we are tempted to save it for ourselves. 
for all the times we turn away from your water, for all the times we misuse the water, for all the times we let others go thirsty instead of offering a drink. Forgive us, we pray. Amen. The water of life flows with abundance to fill us with hope, to cleanse us of our guilt, to float us a new life. Washed in the living water, we are forgiven and set free to live an abundant life. Thanks and praise to God. Amen.
God loves you no matter what. Hey guys, it's me again, Douglas. And hey, I don't know if you're like a dog person or something, but I love my dog. Yeah, my dog Roscoe is so great and he loves me so much. And one of the things I love most about Roscoe is that he loves me no matter what. You know, when I come back from school, if I got a really bad score on a test, Roscoe still loves me, he doesn't care. And even if I did something bad, something wrong, Roscoe still loves me. He's always happy to see me. And you know what? God is like that too. God accepts you no matter what. God's love for you is unconditional. It seems like in this life there are so many people and so many places and so many things that require us to jump through all these hoops, right? You gotta do this and you gotta do that and you gotta do this and that and this and that and this and that to be accepted. You know, maybe there's like a program at school and you can only get in if you got really good grades. Or maybe there's a group of kids that you know that will only accept you if you, you know, act just like they do and wear just what they wear and look just like what they look like. But God's not like that. No matter who you are, no matter what you look like, no matter what you've done, God loves you. And you might be thinking that God will only accept you if you're perfect, and that's just not true. God loves you, even though you're not perfect. Because let me tell you, you are not perfect. And the Bible says that God demonstrated his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus didn't die for you because you're perfect. He died for you because you're not perfect. And he loves you anyways. And if you believe in Jesus Christ, then you are accepted, no matter who you are. And one of the things that's, that's much bigger and better about God than my dog, you know, one of the many, many things, is that Roscoe, he, he loves me no matter what, kind of because he doesn't really understand, right? Roscoe loves me no matter what because he doesn't know what a report card is. He did eat my report card one time, so he knows what a report card tastes like, but he doesn't know what it is. But see, God does know. God knows exactly what you've done when you've sinned. But he still accepts you. He still accepts sinners. But unlike my dog, God helps me to be who I was meant to be, right? He accepts me and then helps me to be a better me. So I hope that you know that no matter who you are, no matter what you look like, no matter where you come from, no matter what you've done, if you believe in Jesus Christ, you are accepted by God. Hey guys, I hope you liked this video. And seriously, I hope that you know that no matter who you are, or what you can do, or where you come from, or where you look like, God loves you. And he wants you to be a part of his family. And so if you would like to accept the free gift of salvation, if you would like to be a part of God's family, if you would like to be accepted by God, I want you to find a pastor, find a real person, find a pastor or a Christian or anybody that you know that knows Jesus, and tell them that you want to accept the free gift of salvation. I'm sure they would love to help you through it. God loves you and he wants to accept you into his family. And all you have to do is believe in Jesus Christ. I invite you to take a look at your bulletin this morning for those who are on our prayer list. And We've got an additional one that we'll mention here in just a moment, but I would invite you to respond as I call out each day. Oh, children are dismissed. It's in the bulletin this week. I'm getting... <laughs> um, I'll be um, saying their names, giving their first and, and last name or a, a brief summary and then we'll respond as a congregation with Lord hear our prayers and then we will close with the Lord's Prayer. Lord we lift up to you today Mike Isabel. Lord hear our prayers. For Porter Steen. Lord, hear our prayers. For Mercedes Patrick. Lord, hear our Scott Stark. Moffat Craig, Lord, our customs officials at the border, as well as the orphans and children at the border, Lord, and our wonderful first responders, especially those who find themselves in very difficult situations. 
And we pray for Ed Malone, friends of Bob and Sharon Moore. And we thank you, O oh God, this day for the opportunity to pray, to lift our voices, to lift our hearts to you, our cares, our concerns, perhaps even for those who are not even in a condition to, to even pray for themselves. We pray for those who are going through times of confusion, through times of loneliness. We pr uh, continue to pray that more and more of the issues with the pandemic would subside, that we can be together, that we can see faces, that we can hug and show our love for one another, unlike we've been able to do in the past year. Lord, hear our prayers this day, and hear the prayer as we pray, the one that our Lord, your Son, taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. <laughs> Our scripture lesson this morning is the story of the woman at the well from John chapter 4. And I invite you to follow along as we read uh, in your bulletin. Listen to God's word. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, you are a Jew and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. And Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us the well and drink from it himself? As did also his sons and his flocks and his herds? Jesus answered, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give him will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. And the woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I don't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. May God bless this, these verses to our, our um, nourishment and our spiritual knowledge this day. Go ahead and pop that up on the screen. It's going to, the woman at the well is going to show up here in just a minute. I guarantee you. <laughs> you know, the Bible has many metaphors for using water and about our thirst. A couple of them from the Psalms, Psalm 63. We 
can get those up here. There, there she is again. Um, Psalm 63, O oh God, you are my God. I earnestly search for you. My soul thirsts for you. My whole body longs for you in this parched and weary land where there is no water. Or perhaps better known, Psalm 42, as the deer pants for streams of water, so I long for you, O God. I thirst for God, the living God. When can I go and stand before him? In Australia, they have what we might call cattle ranches. There they call them cattle stations. And some are very large, even the size of a small country. Some of them can have as many as a half a million animals on them. And rain is infrequent, so the livestock have to go around to try to find water. So to keep the animals on the station or the ranch, there are two choices. One is to put up a really big fence, or the other is to dig a well. And if you dig the well, the fence is irrelevant because the well will draw the animals to it. They will stay there where they have their uh, fresh resources of water. And we know the human being cannot, that a human being cannot live without water. We can live longer without food than we can with, without water. Um, back in Jesus' day, looking for water, trying to find water, was extremely important. And it would take up great blocks of a person's time to go to the well to get water for cooking, for bathing, for drinking. And the water could also become a source of disease if they weren't careful. As we know, water is extremely important. For most Americans, fresh water is abundant. We just have a pipe that's coming into our house that we don't even see. We turn on the faucet, and there it is, and we don't even think a second thought about it. Well, in Jesus' day, the well was not only a place to get water, but the well was also a place where the women gathered to socialize together. So in this story of the woman at the well, Jesus has just been to the Passover in Jerusalem. He is now on his way back to the area of Galilee to a city called Capernaum. And the shortcut, easy way back, would go through an area called Samaria. That was the quickest route. However, the Samaritans were not pure-blooded Jews. And so if a full-blooded Jew walked through the area of Samaritan and passed by some of the Samaritans, they would become defiled just because of their proximity to the Samaritans. So they would take the long cut rather than the short cut to avoid that area of Samaria. So it added a lot of miles to their trip. This was kind of their version in their day of racism. Have you ever known a person who uh, every time you would see them you could tell they were avoiding you? They would kind of walk the other way. Or perhaps you have been the person who was trying to avoid someone. You see them, you turn down the aisle at the grocery store, and you oh, there they are. And so you turn back around and go to the next aisle. Or what about groups of people who are avoiding other groups of people, like white people avoiding black people, or avoiding someone who speaks Spanish? Or what about straight people avoiding those who are gay? Or Republicans avoiding Democrats, Christians avoiding non-Christians. Now, doesn't it just make life easier if we can just avoid these people altogether? But any woman who would be at the well when this woman was there, which was the absolute hottest part of the day, was obviously trying to avoid somebody or somebodies. Not only was she a Samaritan woman, that's pretty much two strikes against her, but the third strike was that she was a Samaritan woman with a bad reputation. Strike three, you're out. 
She did not want to be, be seen, so that's why she went at the hottest part of the day, because if she went at the cool part of the day in the morning or in the evening, there would be the other women who were there gathering around the well, not just to get their water for the day, but they were socializing with each other, and you could just hear a few of them saying, you see that woman over there? Oh, well, you know about her, don't you? So it was a difficult thing for this woman to do. Imagine people avoiding you all of your life, which is what this woman had experienced. She had men who were using her for their own pleasures and dumping her like a piece of trash out on the street. Here was a woman who was looking for love and never finding it. She was looking for love in all the wrong places, as the song goes, until one day when she met this man, Jesus. And this encounter did not happen by accident because if Jesus were truly a Jew, he would have avoided the area of Samaria. He would have taken the long cut back to Capernaum. But Jesus knew that he had an appointment from God because the people of Samaria needed to know God just as much as the Jewish people so she took, he took this route through Samaria, even though he was a Jew. Well, everyone has a desire, the universal desire to be known by someone for exactly who they are, warts and all, and to be loved and accepted anyway. Because we all have those parts of our lives that aren't pleasant, that we don't really want people to know about, and we wish they weren't there ourselves, but they are. But Jesus loved the woman at the well, despite the socio-political ideology of the day. Jesus defies cultural barriers to show her love and acceptance like she had never known. Many of you have heard of the term politically correct. Well, nowadays, politically correct has morphed into a couple of new terms called the woke culture and the cancel culture. And here's kind of how this goes. The woke culture are those who believe that they are more enlightened than other people. And if other people don't believe as they do, then those people aren't woke. In fact, we need to cancel them because they don't believe what I believe. And that's basically the end of the subject. On some very important issues, this happens, especially uh, racially or politically charged issues. So racism, sexuality, environmental issues, diversity, the media, free speech, economics, and even religion. There are those who think if you do not have the same ideas I do, then you are part of the cancel culture. I am going to cancel you. You are not as enlightened as I am, so I'm going to shut you down. I'm going to ignore you. And if you say something incorrectly on social media, like Facebook or Twitter, you might even have your account suspended. So say the wrong thing, do the wrong thing, offend the wrong person then you are marginalized, insulted, excluded, or ignored if you don't have the acceptable narrative. And it used to be, years ago, people actually, if they disagreed, they would sit down and talk with each other, or they would have a debate, or they would argue with one another and let the dust settle where it may but they didn't cancel each other. We still had free speech. But Jesus doesn't do things in the normal, traditional, ideological way that the Jewish people thought things should be done back at the time. He goes out of his way instead. He defies the cultural barriers to show this woman the love that she had never known throughout her entire life. As much as she tried to find love, she couldn't. And that is who Jesus is when someone actually meets Jesus, not just hears about Jesus or they hear about what the Bible says about Jesus 
and it's not correct, it's not true. People think other thoughts because somebody has told them something about the Bible that is incorrect. And so they get these preconceived notions in their mind about who Jesus is, and that, that's not who Jesus is at all. So Jesus loved the woman despite the socio-political ideology of the day. And secondly, Jesus loved the woman at the well and engages her at her greatest point of need. Jesus was so good at finding out where a person's greatest point of need was. What was really the, the deep thing that was missing in their heart. We would not think of depriving our bodies of food and water, so why do people deprive their souls of spiritual food and living water? That's what Jesus saw that she was truly missing, was spiritual food and this living water that he talks to her about. This woman, like anyone else, needed physical water to survive, to cook, to bathe, to take care of herself. There were a lot of other wells that she could have gone to that were probably closer to where she lived. But she went to this one because she knew that in the middle of the day, no one would be there. She could avoid all the people that would talk about her behind her back. And on this occasion, she met there a man who did not judge her because she would dread the judgment and the rejection that we, she would have received from everyone else. But when someone engages her without a voice of judgment and rejection, she begins to open up all those things that had been bottled up inside her. How often do we ask someone, how are you? Every once in a while, we get an unexpected answer. And we're not quite prepared for it. We don't know then. We're caught off guard. We don't know what to say. But there are those moments in our lives that come unexpectedly that are good interruptions. They're good interruptions because I think so often they are God's interruptions. God interrupts our plans. God interrupts our calendars for something that is more important and more urgent at the time. And Jesus meeting this woman at the well, her coming there at the time when Jesus happened to be there, when she thought she was going to avoid everyone, was God's appointment. And when we take time to be present with someone, even when it's unexpected, we are offering them a cool, refreshing glass of water in a spiritual sense. The woman's greatest need was not the water from Jacob's well, but what she needed was the eternal spring from which flows everlasting life and living water. Some wells that we drink from in life offer us more harm than, than good. So why do people deprive their souls of Jesus and the Bible and prayer and that which will truly eternally satisfy so often it's because they've heard things that about jesus that aren't wrong or that are wrong they're not right they're incorrect they've been deceived about who jesus is and there are a lot of people in the world today a lot of groups that are trying to deceive us about who we are as christians and what we stand for and who jesus is that he came to forgive our sins. They think that we don't really have a sin problem. Oh, we may make some mistakes every now and then, but that's okay. But it's not a sin problem that anybody else has to take care of for you. But we know that that's not true. So Jesus met this woman, and he tells her about living water. And here's a man that she had never met. And when she met Jesus, this whole thing about living water begins to make some sense. For up to this time, she'd lived a life full of a lot of troubled waters rather than living waters. So low self-esteem, loneliness, never knowing real love, probably financial struggles, sexual confusion. Like you and me, she, would still, she will still struggle with those issues even after she meets Jesus 
like we all do, we still have issues that we struggle with, but we've given our life to Christ, but yet now she has the power and the spirit, the ability to face the challenges that would come her way. Jesus just doesn't do away with it all. He gives us the strength, the power, the wisdom, and the knowledge to deal with it. So Jesus loved the woman, and he met her at her greatest point of need. And then thirdly, Jesus loved the woman at the well and neither accuses her nor excuses her of her sin. She still had to deal with this sin problem. And unless she she saw her sin and her need for forgiveness, only then would she be able to understand the gift of living water. This woman wants to live a life of this living water, the the life that Jesus offers her. She would love to do nothing else more than to come to this, to never have to come to this well again and see all of those people that she was trying to avoid. But she didn't quite understand the idea of living water until she first understood the whole thing about sin and the need for forgiveness. And when she began to understand that, this whole idea of living water began to make sense. That was far more than what she could see or what she could drink. You see, when we accuse people of their sin, they raise their defenses. Oh, you did this. (gasps) And they get real defensive. But when we excuse people from their sin, we enable their denial. So there's something kind of in between here that we need to do to deal with sin. This past week, for about three days, we had a sort of a mini Gale family reunion. I had the opportunity to see folks that I haven't seen for a long time and catch up with them. And I have, I got permission from my cousin. Her name is Kathleen Delman. She was originally a Gale. And she shared this story at the dinner table the other night. She is a very devout Christian, um, but she had some thoughts and opinions about the gay community. And her brother, my cousin Paul, was very involved in the gay community in New York for a number of years until Paul became very ill um, and nearly died because of of a parasite. And so all of Paul's family lived in California. But his parents and his siblings all took turns coming to New York to take care of of him during that time. And my cousin Kathleen tells how when she went out there to do her turn, she saw the homosexual gay community gather around her brother in a way that she never thought she would see, and it completely changed her opinion. It didn't change what she believed about homosexuality and the lifestyle, etc. but she saw people for more than just their gayness or their homosexuality, that they were truly still children of God who cared for people. And so often we have difficulty, we see the obvious about certain folks, and that's what we dwell upon. And that's what the people would have seen the the woman at the well for, for her sin, but they wouldn't see her for the deepest need that she had. Jesus sees us for the deepest need that we have, and not so often God brings into our lives people who can see through that and help bring us out of that whole mentality that we're just kind of stuck in, to open up the world around us and see that there is more to a person than what, than what meets the eye. Like the woman at the well, Jesus neither accuses us nor excuses us of our sin. Jesus is all about changing people's hearts, even hearts that love Jesus can have some dark corners in those hearts. And the message about sin and forgiveness and living water now began to make sense to this woman. 
And even as followers of Jesus, we can be more occupied with building fences than digging wells of living water to draw people to us, to draw people so that they can see the love of Jesus living in us and flowing through us. And as I close, uh, John uh, chapter 4, verse 14. Whoever drinks the water I give him will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Amen. me now for our benediction. And now may the living Christ go with you, before you, to show you the way, behind you, to encourage you, beside you, to be your friend, above you, to watch over you, and within you, to give you peace. And all of God's people say,